on, we'll pretend this is an upper six. And if you haven't used these, these little defender wedges, I think they're from Garrison. They work really well, especially when you're brand new, trying to protect the adjacent teeth. But what it also does, it also pre-wedges. So it might absolutely, might actually increase the, uh, your contact strength, especially if you're doing composite. Now, of course, we're doing amalgam. Now, just like in real life, if you try to put two wedges in, it just doesn't work. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start with our depth cuts. Um, I'm using a 557 five, burr. It's pretty simple. We're going to the the th the key that's really important is to know the de the diameter of your burrs. So this the 557 five, is a, is a 1 millimeter diameter burr. So our depth cuts need to be double the depth. And you know a really quick way to see, you know, clinically if you're at the right depth is to actually use so let's go speed along here. So actually use the this end of the Explorer. So what you can do, I remember an old timer just like me, showed me that this actually end is two millimeters long. So you can quickly assess intraorally whether you've got two millimeters depth or not. All right, so we'll just keep on refining our Depth cuts. Now, don't forget, especially in amalgam, we want to have two mils, if not deeper. Now, I know it seems like it's like, oh my gosh, I'm removing two millimeters of two structure, and I used to be like that too. But honestly, this preparation is actually less invasive than a crown preparation because really what we're doing is we're only removing the occlusal two millimeters of our preparation versus actually reducing, you know, 0.8 to 0.5 to one millimeter around the cervical part of the tooth. Now, if you think after you do a root canal, you've actually, you, you've, you know, bored out, machined out part of the, the orifice of the root. So you're actually thinning where the pericervical dentin is with doing a crown preparation. So ironically, this is actually more conservative uh, when you talk about mechanical strength of the tooth. So what we're do, gonna do now is we're just gonna join the dots. And you know, I've alluded to this before, don't take one of those flat diamonds and, uh, that looks like a pancake on the end and just make this a perfectly flat table because you won't have any resistance form when you're carving your amalgam. Now there is a composite here. I'm gonna pretend this is just two structure. Every clinical situation seems to be different whether or not you would remove all of it. Ideally you would, um, but in this case, we're gonna pretend it's just natural two structure. So there's the beauty of the fender wedge uh, in real life or on extractive tooth. I can, it actually speeds up my preparation. So what I'm doing is I'm removing some of the composite and then I just decided, well, it's just, it's too much. It's, it's beyond the scope of what this, what I want to produce in this video. So we're just going to leave it like that. We're going to open up kind of where the composite ends, just the margins on the mesial box. Remove it from the access, the rest of the composite from the access, and then we'll keep going. So we'll take out that wedge and then we'll add it to the distal part. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to break the contact. And again, we talked about this earlier. We're literally making a 0.8 you know, millimeter, 0.8 millimeter width of a preparation. Now, if you're really squirrely about uh, removing tooth st structure, you know, just think that in your zirconia crown or your full porcelain crown is going to remove one millimeter. So if you go back and cut this for a regular crown someday, you're going to remove that anyways. So this, this is critical, this little, well, not my finger in the way, but it's really critical to get break that contact so you can get your band all the way down and provide that resistance form for your amalgam when you're going to carve it. So we take it out and we're going to refine everything. We're going to smooth all of our, I'm going to speed it up here. You can use whatever burr you want. So what I'm going to do is I just had a diamond kicking around. So I just took a diamond. I'm going to round off. Remember in that in the overview, we round off all these corners. So we're going to round everything off. And then we're going to make sure that we don't have any like jagged edges. We want this to be smooth flowing. We don't want it to be flat across. We want it smooth flowing, but jagged edges like this. We want to get rid of 
anything that's going to act like a point of stress concentration when we carve our amalgam, you really want to get rid of it. Now, it's been a few, it's actually been a, been a month since I've filmed this. All right, I got rid of it. <laughs> it's been about a month since I've, then I filmed this, and now I'm redoing it because I was, uh, I was actually in isolation when I voiced over, and I was, um, you could hear my man cold. My man flu. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have coronavirus, but uh, I had a head cold that my kids gave me. Um, so I'm actually watching this again for the fourth time, but for the first time in a while. So we're going to round everything off. You can even put your slow, because this is an electric handpiece, and one way you can remember with our handpieces, see the red dot, our electric, I ask you to use your electric handpiece, give it a rip, because you can slow down the RPMs, and red means danger. This is what the BN Air uh, rep told me. If you can't remember what the handpiece is, and I just learned this last year, red is danger, so that's automatically the high speed when you pull it off. It's like red, high speed, blue is slow speed, and you can adjust the speed so you're not, you know, we're not whittling away the tooth super fast we can you can slow it down round everything off and conserve to structure it's great for refining crown margins that's what i'll do is i'll spin it down to about four thousand forty thousand um to refine my crown margins with a fine burr it's beautiful so we're going to place our auto matrix critical tool i used one just today with one of our captains and we actually if you can believe it, I put a couple pins. I mean, the tooth was almost destroyed by uh, previous existing restoration and recurrent decay. Uh, we had no walls. I mean, it's verging on non-restorable, but through a couple pins, actually the pin went horizontal, horizontal. There was less tooth structure than this. Horizontal, horizontal, vertical. And the, one of the, so when you place pins, the four corners. And actually placing pins on these large restorations, although it's gone out of style, it can help you. Say this wall was gone, it can help provide you some resistance form, especially, so we're talking about not only retention of the amalgam, but also resistance of the forces when you go to carve it, because um, not only are we, we want to, I mean, we want to retain the restoration, we also want to make sure it's carved properly. So righty tidy with the auto matrix, and then we lefty, get it really tight, and then lefty loosey, let me go back to that one second. So we're going to place our auto matrix we all know to use our Explorer just to weasel it down uh, around two structure. And then what I'm going to do is I'll get the wrench or whatever you want to call it, the tightener. So we're going to go righty tighty till it clicks. Let's see if we can hear it click. Uh, I couldn't hear it. And then what you do is once it's tight, this little clip binds it and then you lefty loosey off. You know, you really got to practice this. This is invaluable. I used it today. And the captain I was working with, I mean, um, they were going to use a Toffelmeyer with a with a little slit um, of a piece of Toffelmeyer matrix to cover where the uh, the Toffelmeyer thing is. But I mean, this is way faster, way way faster. So we'll place our wedge, and then we're going to burnish our contact. If you haven't used these wedges on a stick, they're actually really helpful. So one of the other things I wanted to throw in here is if you haven't used uh, plumber's tape or Teflon tape, this is actually really thick. There's usually, there's thinner type. You can pack it in. So you can see, I'm actually going to take it out of here, but just pack it in to get that contour. There's actually on the distal, it's actually, I'm going to take this out and put it in there, but literally watch me pack it in and that seals the floor. Now really when we're creating these restorations, it's important to the most important part of this restoration in my mind is the gingival health of the tissue. Too often um, we're focused on the easy things while we're waiting for this restoration to set, so it's the occlusion. Uh, but the real critical one is to get, make sure you don't get any overhangs. The occlusion you can adjust with a burr down the road, like once it's set. So <clears throat> what you just saw there is this old school burnisher. I couldn't fit it in there because the point eight, it was the ball is bigger than the point eight. So what I used, actually one of the captains was sitting there watching me and she's like, you should use the spoon. I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. So I'm just using the spoon because this contact's pretty tiny and I'm slowly extracting my tooth out of the plastic as we do this. So we're gonna burnish that. Um, and then what I notice is that I'm opening the contact. I'm opening the gingival box 
So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take that Teflon out and repack it. You know, doing these things is really like I just finished uh, tiling our kitchen backsplash. It's a second tiling job. I'm not really a fan of tiling. A good friend of mine loves this stuff. But I'll tell you, the second time I did it, whoa, we're getting out of the picture here. So as you can see, we're packing it in there. And it's amazing because it holds shape. You got to try with using this as cord, as um, retraction cord. It works, I'd say, in 85% of the times, and it's amazing. You just keep packing it in the saw, in the uh, in the sulcus. So there's our preparation. What I wanted to say was that so we're going to take our amalgam, we're going to break it, break open the capsule, and resist the temptation. Even when I was doing the amalgam today, because I helped her out, did a five surface amalgam, I had to repeat in my mind, resist the temptation to throw this into there in one piece because what I've learned is that it doesn't you don't give it time to set as you compact it and what happens is it just crumbles when you go to carve it so you really got to you know packing it placing it getting it carried with the amalgam carrier into your preparation just gives it more time to set so don't resist the temptation if you have to mentally tell yourself while you're doing this resist the temptation because really this shortcut is going to burn you down the road so a lot of a lot of what we do in dentistry is preparation. And if you prepare it properly, you take the time for preparation down the road, what will happen is that actually it, you speed up the procedure. So by placing your matrix properly, by getting the right reduction, by getting uh, the right wedges in, by getting you know this gingival box seal, you see it's perfectly sealed here. This side was kind of, I mean, it's so-so, we'll make it work. Um, it's just like tiling, and I found that if I didn't have everything lined up properly, like with a, uh, a level of my tiles, the tiles start going up the wall subtly. And then it just causes you more work and grief when you gotta take all the tiles off. So YouTube was good for learning all those tips, but, and that's the same as what you're doing right now, but really need to, you know, if you're brand new in dentistry, it's really, it's important to take the time. You know, if you, the first time you're probably gonna, it's gonna be a rough go, but Learn from what you did the first time and, you know, plan it out. Plan for all those what ifs. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just packing in the, the amalgam. Just like we normally do. So let's speed up because we don't really need to see this. It's pretty simple. So while I'm packing, I'm just kind of keeping track of where the margins of uh, my adjacent teeth are. Speed this up to 10 speed. Let's go to 30. There we go. Boop, 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 boop. It's really quick. All right, so now, magically, we've gone through about five uh, capsules of amalgam, and let's start carving this. So I think I'm carving now. Nope, we're going to add some more. So of course, we're just kind of moving it around. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do, let's slow this down to two. First thing I'm gonna do, you can do whatever you want. These are just what I've been doing for 20 years and it seems to work. I'm just gonna kinda, I'm trying to figure out where two structure is on one side. So I'm slowly working my way down with my Explorer because we know that this this band goes way, you know, way wide or way buckle angly of the, the two structure. So I'm going to make my way down with my, my oh, and uh, yeah, actually what you just saw there, that's right. I chipped off a chunk that was like, ah, I'm making a video, but actually this is better. So you can see here what's going to happen is I'm going to break off a chunk with my Explorer and boom, right there. I'm like, ah, fiddlesticks. So it's a perfect time to do it because it's right when the amalgam's fresh. And actually, you're going to see me thin out the amalgam too much, uh, over -redu reduce it, and we're going to reprep. Uh, and this is what you need to do in real life. So we're going to throw some more, not throw, we're going to place some more amalgam right in that corner, pack it in, and then continue down our journey of making this look like a silver tooth. So as you can see, I'm just using my Explorer to kind of even things out and then I've given it some time now it's been some time 
So we take these cutters and we're just gonna clip that band like that. And what that does is it unleashes the band. So what I can do is I can unravel this. You don't need to do it this. You can just unravel it, whatever you want. Or just, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to open up the window, open up this band so I can get a little bit of a window. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue removing amalgam down. I'm not taking this band off because that's what's keeping everything. That's what's, this band is the pants. It's the pants are keeping the amalgam together. So I'm just going to solely use my my explorer to, because I can see two structure now, I'm just gonna weasel my way down to two structure. And I'm not taking that band off for a while. So really the key right now is I'm trying to do everything in my power. I don't know if power is the right word, but we'll use it. Everything in my power to contour my gingival portions of this restoration as best as possible because now is the time when you can you can handle it you can mold it you can sculpt it if you want if you may so i'm going to open that up more because i'm not going to attack the occlusion you're just wasting your time because this is how overhangs are formed so what we're going to do is we're going to do all our contours and then once our amalgam is close to set you know if it's if it's too late to do the occlusion with a hand instrument, we'll just do it with a brown burr. And that's the beauty of the electric, is you can slow down your burrs really slow, especially if you're new at this game. Slow it down so you don't uh, zing away some of your amalgam. But by that time, it's probably set. So this is the most critical part. We're trying to get these contours. So now you can see some two structure right here. So I know kind of where I can put the tip of my instrument and run it along, kind of back and forth, and just smooth out that restoration. Turn the patient upside down, knock out the amalgam out of the, out of the band, and keep going. And that's all I'm doing. This is what I've come to, to, really realize that after doing you know hundreds of these things um, that this is the most efficient way to do it that way when we take you know if you take a periodical radiograph afterwards it's like okay we're good so just to make my life a little bit easier and i'm not lying to you i'm not adjusting the occlusion i'm just to make my life a little bit easier and get contours so we don't i think i'm about a two mils high on the distal here uh, we're just going to use this instrument called the collapse it now what's really neat about this instrument is that what i was taught by an old timer just like i am now for you is that always pull away pull towards the center of the tooth when you're doing your margins so with this instrument you can you know so i'm going to pull and then if you turn your patient around and put them upside down you can pull away so i'm always pulling towards the center of the tooth versus the other way which will fra potentially fracture so it's a great instrument to get a really quick reduction you know, the key of these, of, you know, the, the real key of this restoration is protection of our cusp from, from flexure and fracture of that tooth. Honestly, the ugly duckling wins. If, you know, if I see your name on a, you know, down the road, if you see, if I see your name on one of these amalgams in the chart and it looks like, it looks terrible, I'm going to email you and say, great job, because it doesn't matter about what it looks like. This looks like heck. It's really about having great gingival health and protection of that tooth and getting that patient fit. Because the patient we did this on today, boom, he's fit and he's going to, I think they're going to Latvia right now. And that's really the key. So, you know, like I tell the captains here, the ugly duckling gets the worm. So if yours is the ugliest possible, you win the competition. So this is now one of the key instruments that's really critical. Oh, we're going to zoom in and really get it. Uh, so one of the key instruments, it's called a, an interproximal carver. It's super sharp because no one ever uses them. This contouring instrument is great for contouring your gingival health. It can, and it's got all these curves, uh, buccal lingual con um, contours. I mean, it's just amazing. So I'm going to use this kind of like a scaler, but I'm also going to use it to carve as well. So we're going to come up in our interproximals. We're going to get, you can see here, I'm going to use it to carve this contour, that lingual kind of incline on the lingual cusps. I think I'm literally just showing off right now, just all the contours. I don't know. It's hard to tell what was going on at the time. 
So that's it. So you, I still have the band on there. I haven't, okay, other than using the claps and to show that off to do the occlusion, but I haven't done any of the occlusion. So now what I'm doing is I'm trying to get inter, as deep interproximal, the interproximal embrasure as possible, or the gingival embrasure. So what you can do here is I'm just leaning on the band and trying to pull it through the contact a little bit just to get a little more access. And then we're gonna, we're gonna tackle uh, the contours on the lingual side or palatal side. By, again, by tackling all of these, you know, the things that are difficult to do once this is set, it, it gives you the opportunity to not take your band off so fast and then have this, I don't know if you've done one before, but I'll tell you when you take that band off and the whole amalgam fractures in your hands and you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Well, there are a few options. What you can do is you can dovetail into that chunk that breaks off and you know pack some more amalgam put a band on if you're at the end of the appointment you could probably put some uh, some com composite in there depending on where you're if it's at the contact it really depends on where you break this thing so my recommendation would be you know if it fractures off kind of like here i just dovetail in with an amalgam and then pack some more if it bre breaks like this kind of you're kind of you know if you're part of the contact is gone you're kind of it's hard, hard to say. If you can get a band back down there, contour it well. And if you still have a contact without it, you can even put some composite, bond, try to bond some composite in there. Like if it's at, you know, 12, 15, and you, your dental assistant, and the patient have had enough. Um, you know, my, it's hard to say whether or not in my, I mean, everyone's got a different opinion, whether you bring the patient back and finish it, or you just say, or you try to hammer it out right then. But you can always reprep back in and, uh, place more amalgam or bond some composite. You're not doing, you're not, obviously you're not, maybe not obviously, but you're not really bonding to the amalgam, uh, but you are covering the dentin that would be exposed. So here we are, we're still carving away. I haven't, as you can see, I still haven't taken the band off. The band is coming off soon. I know you're anticipating it, but, and that tooth might actually come out too while we're at it. It's just slowly getting loosened. So you can see I'm trying to, again, I can't say it, stress it enough. Contour the gingiva, contour everything you can't get to um, before this thing hardens like crazy. The conclusion you can just easily use a burr. So one of the things I was talking about with my captain today is that as you can see, okay, well that's the band, but if there's a restoration on this tooth here and you're about to put a new restoration and this contour sucks, I would 100% make your life easier. Recontour the restoration or even pack a new one in here or, you know, place some flow ball or something just to get a better contour that will help you get a better contact. And contact's really important. You know, it's taken me about honestly 20 years to figure out what the importance of a contact is like the true, I mean, it's to prevent food from getting caught in there and blah, blah, blah. But honestly, without a proper contact, people get food impacted, but then what happens is they get secondary decay. That, I mean, I see that on implants natural teeth next to implants without a contact they're getting food jammed in there and so you can put the little okay let me step it let me just change topics here the little hole here you can use that to pull out i think my contact's pretty hard so it's not going to work i think i have to grab the uh hemostats to pull this bad boy out of there so really getting a great contact is more than just like you know trying to snap the floss when you when you uh do your floss check it's really about preventing, in my mind, periodontal disease, but also really recurrent decay uh, on the adjacent teeth. That's, I see that so many times. And when I mentioned implants, it's really, you know, when we get, whether the teeth are drifting, you get that mesial drift of teeth in the opening of contacts. I still haven't gotten the right answer from anyone about what that is. Um, whatever it is, you get an open contact. And I've noticed like people getting Patients having decay on the teeth adjacent implants just because they have an open contact. So now we've got our uh, band off. Let's bring this down. Whoops. We've got our band off. We're going to flick out that Teflon. Hopefully my tooth doesn't come out again. And what we're going to do here is just review our our gingival embrasures 
and you can see we've got it. I'm really happy with that. We've got, it's nice and smooth. We've got nothing overhanging that we can see. So as you can see still, I've just got this like, I don't know, like bent nickel kind of look on the occlusal. <clears throat> Haven't adjusted it at all. And I'm going to take a, slowly use a round burr because it's starting to harden up, starting to set. And yeah, the restoration might look like the surface of the moon uh, when I'm done with it, when we've got it in occlusion. But I'll tell you, my gingival health is good. Uh, my on this tooth, the periodontal status might be not too good because we're getting pretty mobile here. But uh, in real life, to my mind, that's really what is important. That contact and gingival embrasure, no overhangs. So here we are again, same thing. Really getting into that contour. If you're wondering what this is, because I couldn't figure it out until I watched the video, it's actually just old composite that's now um, just becoming darkened by the amalgam. So this is a great instrument to run along the marginal ridge. Oh, don't go to the screen. There we go. Um, marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth, just to get the right height. So I'll just use that. So one of the th one of the first things I do uh, just to now we're going to talk about checking occlusion because I can't check occlusion uh, without closing teeth. So I'm going to run that till it's about even. Uh, but I will, what I will do is I've really come to use, and it's a really quick gauge, is to get the patient to lightly bite down after taking the rubber dam off and just look at the opposite, the contralateral occlusion. And literally, I'm going to ask them. So say this is the patient's right. Uh, so this is tooth number one six. What I'm gonna get them to do is I'll look at their occlusion when they bite down on the on the uh, the left side, and then I'll ask them, do your teeth on the contralateral side, like the left side, do they come in? Do they bite down normal? It's not the contralateral side won't be unless it's numb, but if it's usually it's not numb, uh, and they can really quickly gauge like yeah, it's a little bit high or uh, it's coming in together. Uh, I've used that successfully for a decade now, and I wanted to share that with you. It's a really quick way, instead of getting the patient to like, because I used to do this. Okay, we take the rubber dam off, slide ejector, and then we go in, patient, in goes the paper. Okay, lightly bite down for me, and who knows what light means, and bang! And you're like, ah, and it's like 11.58, time for lunch, you're switching out from um, public servant to... Um, a military dental assistant or everything kind of goes sideways. So one of the, that's what I do is I'll get the patient and I take it off. I get them to lightly close and say, can you lightly close? And then just, can you tell me if your teeth are connecting together on the contralateral side normally? And if they're like, yeah, I'm like, boom, I'm in the ballpark. And I can see it as well because they're wear facets. So what I'm going to do here is we're just going to, you know, now we're setting up pretty quick. So with the slow round burr, if this is natural tooth and not a restoration, or say a porcelain, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run it right on the disc, the marginal ridge of this tooth. So that's another way you can do this. And it, you know, it's not gonna, last time I tried to cut enamel with a round burr, it was not very successful. So it's another quick way to kind of judge for your occlusion. And then we're gonna whittle away with our slow round burr. So by this point, you know, this amalgam is pretty well set, not completely. Uh, however, it's sufficient enough to get a nice light brushing technique to quickly get the occlusion within ballpark and not uh, not run over time. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually using, so this is a quick way to assess as well if you've reduced enough or the tooth is too, or the restoration is too high. Remember we reduced two millimeters. So if I take this and kind of ballpark along the height of this lingual cusp with, you know, a, compared to two structure, it gives me a ballpark idea if, I am, if I'm close. So I'm pretty close here. I might be a little bit under-reduced, over-reduced, over-reduced. So we're just gonna work on this embrasure and that, that interproximal carver is great to make that embrasure just like nice and sharp. 
Now, I'm not happy with this contour, but it, it is what it is for this. We'll see if I can, I can't remember if I whittled out. Oh, see that spot right there? So what happened was I actually reduced too much. So in real life, that causes a bit of a problem because before this is set, we know that the area, not only is that area connecting to tooth, we also know that this is pretty minimally thick. So I'm not worried about decay because, I mean, the last time I saw Google decay on a smooth surface was probably never. Uh, but what I am worried about is that tooth fracturing. So what we're going to do is we're going to prep into there and pack in another amalgam. I mean, these things happen. So again, I'm not just saying the ugly duckling what takes the award for best restoration just because I can't carve anything, but maybe that's why I am saying that. I don't know. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our collapsing to get some big bulk removal. Um, that tooth's getting really wobbly. Hopefully, if you're doing, if you've endodontically treated and then a tooth that's uh, Miller Class Three mobility like this, uh, I'm, I wish you luck in its survivability. Fortunately, this just went in the garbage after I think. So anatomy, remember, anatomy is not that important, but this is important. Getting this occlusal embrasure. So we're going to run that and try to and get that occlusal brazier. Beautiful instrument to do that with. Super sharp. I think I can almost hear the clicking of that. I wonder if I can. Nope. No volume. Okay, let's fast forward here and see what else happens. I think I just end up... Okay, so the last thing you're going to do is seal... You can do this after you check your occlusion, is seal off with a burnisher any margins, so you want to burnish them shut. I don't know if this makes a difference, to be honest, but it makes it shiny. I've been told to do this for years. But any margin I can see, I'll just burnish it just to see if I can close it down. Oh, that's what I'm going to do. So next, I'm going to prep. Prep out that little spot. Oh, we're going to check with our, oh, so do we, we're going to check with our Explorer, make sure we don't have any overhangs. I'm going to check with our floss. If I don't have a contact, I make that noise. I'm just kidding. So <clears throat> you've got our contact. I think what we're going to do is we're going to prep that out now. Yep. So we're just going to make a prep. And you can see that I had to go this far around it just to get a full two millimeter thickness back. So that's a pretty simple fix. So we're just gonna place some amalgam in there. Oh, I sped right past it, burnish it down. And now we're just going to finish this up. I mean, this restoration's done. Time to check it. I'm just doing this to uh, have some credibility, make it look decent. Let's see what happens. And then you can, like one of our, here we go. So one of our captains said, you know, he tells a patient, I'm gonna bring it back and polish it. It's for me, not for you. And that's what I found. Like when I was in Belgium, I had time to uh, bring patients back and polish their amalgams, but they honestly couldn't tell the difference whether it was polished or not. And they didn't really care to be honest, but it was for me, my personal pride. Oh, there we go. So we are going to polish it. So we let it set for 24 hours. In all honesty, this really just sat for about two. The book says 24. I don't know. That's what I was taught. I'm not sure if that's true. So we use a greeny or we use a brownie point, slow speed. And then we'll throw a greeny on there just to make it look nice. It doesn't influence, oh, look at that. Okay, so, uh, instruments are... <laughs> That's the intro. It doesn't influence the uh, the, the outcome of that uh, restoration at all. So anyways, that is our occlusal amalgam, our uh, five surface amalgam, cuspal coverage. I hope there's some tips that you can take away from here. And, you know, when you start doing these, I think it's a really critical 
element of our practice that's bread and butter for what we need to be able to do, especially in these root canal teeth, so we can get the patient fit for deployment and get them uh, on their way to training and back to life. Hope you enjoy. Cheers.